Right. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I hope you had a, an interesting series of discussions in your various breakout uh, sessions. Um, as moderator, uh, I'm afraid I only got to channel surf between the various sessions, um, which didn't end up making much sense. So I am going to be relying on the uh, moderators from each of the breakout sessions to give us uh, a flavor of what you were discussing in your various sessions. Um, as I say, I was sort of channel surfing towards the end and there was various confused looking faces, uh, most of them saying something to the effect of expect the unexpected in various guises. So I, from what I've seen, that's the conclusion from all of your panels. Um, but uh, maybe we can get a few more details out of uh, each of you. Um, Guy, let's start with you, if you don't mind, because I probably listened to yours more than most. International trade was your topic. You had an hour to sort out the future of international trade. I, I'm, I'm assuming you, you had time to spare in that discussion. Yeah, we moved on to other world peace after that. You know. Absolutely. Good, good. Well, it's good to hear. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's hear the, sort of the highlights from your perspective. What, was, was, uh, what did you get? It was a fascinating uh, discussion, actually. Some real depth of experience there and some thoughts. I think um, you won't be surprised. It's going to be, there's, there's a huge uncertainty for the future as we come out of COVID. A lot of market uncertainty. Um, you know, it's been a real topsy-turvy year anyway for shipping. Different sectors, you know, doing really well at times as well as, as, as the other way. And I think there's also a feeling that the COVID is perhaps um, more focused on localism and, and regionalization. You know, as supply chains came under pressure and the like, and, and some, you know, some of the panelists felt that's going to, to, to you see more of. You know, why on earth would you buy butter from halfway across the world when you could produce it locally? So there's a there's sort of feeling about that, and, and even if that only had a, a very small effect on world trade, that could have quite a disproportionate effect on shipping. So it's something that we, we need to think about. Um, we we the other the thought was on protectionism. We had a, a really good conversation around that. You know, uh, Brexit, whilst it may be a free trade agreement, it's a lot of non-tariff barriers there, which you know can be construed as protectionist by any other 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 way, and we see evidence of more of that coming in the world and, and of course we need to make the case of shipping that that is just as if, you know it's such a negative game to get into because we know that trade and, and free trade frees up people out of poverty so how do we make that the, the, the case for that um i think there's a feeling uh, i asked a question about where do you, you know this consolidation in the industry in the next 10 years and i think two out of three said yes there'll be more but one uh, in particular said, well, you know, there'll be some market disruptors coming in because we've seen the game change so much over the last few years and indeed the last year in terms of digitalization. So that's there. We had a little bit about whether there was a case for cabotage, limited cabotage. And I think the feelings was is that although the heart says you can see the, the lodging in it, the head says, no, it, it's just it's going to be ultimately negative in, in, in terms of, 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 of what it delivers. And we also talked a little bit about free ports and whether they were a good idea, in particular in the UK context, and the, the, there's opportunities there, but I think there was some a real scepticism about delivery and you know these free ports. Where are you going to send the markets? Is it to the EU? And you know, is that are they really going to accept the idea of free ports on their on their doorstep as well? So it was a it was a, a range, and I think the other thing to to take is about ESG. You know, coming out of COVID, it's going to be much more focused on ESG, on build back better, build back greener. And this will accelerate the, the you know the drive of the decarbonisation and that uncertain future for, for shipping as well. So, um, real a real sort of uh, smorgasbord of opinions and and different ideas and, and thoughts as we went through it. So I hope that gives you a, a brief summary. No, that's great. I I mean we we touched on some of those in the in the the keynote bit with Stephen talking about the the globalisation patterns. I mean. What was the general feeling from your experts in terms of, you know, is, is globalization a done deal? That, that sort of regionalization, was that born out of a return to security or more driven by the sort of the, the general trend of protectionist politics that we've seen? I think it's a, a mixture. I, I think there's still a case for globalization. I mean, as I think the on the dry bulk side of it, you're going to need you know you, you know you're going to need iron ore you're going to need all these materials so that's that that's you know you know you, you can't manufacture that locally you've got it you haven't got it so i think there's a feeling a, a, a about that but um yeah i think there's a there's a there was a sense a, a sense that people could see the regionalization in particular becoming more to the fore in the years to come and did um 
did did Donald come up? I remember I'm going back to uh, one of the global maritime forums that uh, I think you and I attended originally was Gillian Tett from the Financial Times summed it up quite nicely as the three Ds, Donald, uh, digitalization and uh, dirty diesel were the sort of the drivers. Uh, was there any discussion around the sort of the change in sort of tone of politics uh, with the exit of Trump no, and not, Biden? Biden? Not particularly, but we've got to see, you know, the rhetoric may change, but has the policies really changing? You're talking about make it in America and all sorts of other things as well. So let's let's just see how that plays out. But I think it does feed into this. I think it's a, for our industry something we, we need to be wary of, this, this, this increasing protectionism or, or the perception mm -hmm. of protectionism, because and I believe as an industry, we, we all said it, we have to come out strongly and make the case against that. Um, okay. We're a global industry. Okay, well, um, thank you for that. Thank you for the report. Um, Bud, uh, Cruz, I, I, I was tempted to come in. Uh, I, I kept meaning to, but I kept getting distracted by other things. So you're going to need to give us a, a, a quick summary, but uh, I'm assuming that the uh, fairly hefty uh, order book, the, the lack of much Cruz activity happening has uh, probably sparked some fairly obvious conversations. Give us the headlines from your group. Well, uh, we started uh, intentionally focusing on uh, talking about new ships that we have and about new technologies, in particular, how they're going to help us achieve our aspirations as a sector um, towards uh, uh, sustainability goals, in particular, decarbonization. So um, we had um, a, a great panel that represented some diverse um, diverse interests as far as the way the cruise lines are set up. Uh, one has two new ships, uh, one has a couple of um, uh, older ships, uh, but not old. And uh, the other had a range of between 16 ships or 16 passengers on their smallest ship up to more than 6,000 on their biggest ship. So we were able to have a pretty robust discussion around that and talk about um, those sorts of measures that are available, both forward looking for new builds and how we were aiming towards that and also some options for retrofits. But I think a common theme, not just through this topic, but with the others that we spoke about was very much about collaboration and partnership. And there was a uh, universal gratitude towards uh, the UK Chamber's work, uh, particularly around COVID, um, but also uh, um, through the UK Chamber and through CLIA more generally on policy issues of, of mutual interest where no one seems to view those as, as competitive issues as it should be. Um, there was um, universally optimism despite the situation that exists right now where very few cruise ships are operating. I'm fortunate that my company has one ship in operation and, and has more or less continually uh, since August, but that's a very limited restart. And there are a couple of other ships operating around the world in a, in a limited capacity. But as we talked about COVID a little bit more, I think we all agreed that it was important to get that experience and then also to share that experience and bring it back so that other operators could benefit from that as they uh, plan for their own safe and responsible restart as, as the conditions really allow for that. Um, we did talk about uh, new ships and, and uh, the optimism overall towards how we'll emerge on the backside of this as, as the cruise sector, recognizing my company has cruise as one component of, of a, a larger shipping enterprise. And uh, universally, uh, you know, the, the view was this was a great quality value product uh, before the pandemic. And I think Nick Stace put it best from Saga when he said, you know, our only real question is how quickly can we add more capacity because there's so much demand for it. Um, it really doesn't make sense that once society returns back to some degree of normalcy and and desire of consumers to take holidays, and, and there were indications that notwithstanding some conflicting signals at best coming from um, from government, maybe as soon as yesterday or recently as yesterday, bookings are actually there. People do want to take cruises in the future. So um, you haven't seen, you know, large scale um, pullbacks in the order book. I mean, there've been some changes and the yards have some capacity problems, but uh, we continue to see new ships coming online. Our own company uh, just took delivery of one um, uh, just very, very recently, uh, about a week and a half ago, and plans to take another one this year. And we've got another one in the pipeline for next year. And I think we're indicative generally of a sense of 
it was a strong industry before with a great product. It's going to be a strong industry again with a great product, but there's a lot of work to do between here and there to mm -hmm. regain the confidence of uh, our guests first and foremost, but also the regulators and also satisfy ourselves that it's truly safe to operate in that manner for the crew members, for the passengers, and also for the communities that we operate within. So mm -hmm. I think that pretty much sums it up. I'll, I'll just also say what I said again, I, I rarely get the chance to be a moderator anymore. And uh, it really was a pleasure um, to, to do that with, 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 the, with the great group that we had. I'm sorry, I didn't get to more time to spend with you guys. It sounds quite interesting. Yeah, I'm, afraid, I, I'm shameful to say that uh, we are quite sniffy about crews on, on Lloyd's List. It's generally deemed to be sort of hotels on water territory. And they're, they're quite purist, the editorial bunch in Lloyd's List. But from what you've said, actually, there's a lot of uh, very similar, uh, you know, factors that are, you know, cutting across all the major sectors. Uh, and I mean, it's interesting. I think I heard it from somebody else that, uh, you know, they describe cruise as the formula one of shipping because, you know, all of the sort of the really exciting technological advances are sort of filtering down from cruise. And if you want to sort of look at the highest tech, highest spec ships, that's where you go. So uh, actually, you, much more interesting than uh, I, I'm afraid some of my colleagues on Lloyd's List have given you credit for. Well, I I love ships in general. Anybody that knows me knows I love ships and I love shipping. So I've landed in a good place because we have a very diverse fleet and I love all the ship types we have. But of the ship types we have, if you think about, you know, a, a, sometimes northward of a billion euro in capital expenditures to build a ship and a lifespan that you know, nobody knows for sure, but um, it can be up to 40 years and maybe beyond. You have some options available when it comes to making long-term investments that um, are kind of unique to that ship type and also um, some dynamics of how those ships interact with um, uh, business to consumer business, which mm -hmm. most of shipping is business to business, and also how closely we interact with the communities we're in. It really all kind of lends itself for pushing the cutting edge in technologies, particularly environmental technologies. And also you can absorb um, some risk and some cost into a, a ship of, of that sort of capital investment that maybe is harder to justify um, with a ship that, that maybe is capitalized at a much smaller level to start with. Mm. Yeah, no, it is, it is genuinely interesting. Um, I should have mentioned to the audience at the outset, um, because of the limitations in terms of how many people we can get up, we are going to get to the other session. So the fact that you can only see a few of the moderators here, don't worry, they are coming. But it does mean that we are limited on time. So I am going to quickly move on to Fran. But before I do, I'm going to say, if you do want to pose any questions to these moderators, things that you may have wished you'd heard from the other sessions, but you just couldn't tear yourself away from Guy on his trade uh, discussions, uh, now is the time to get those questions in. I can see them coming through, so I will try to uh, distribute them liberally around the moderators as we get them. But uh, put your questions in and I'll see what I can do. Uh, now, Fran, um, fairies, I mean, I'm assuming that there was some uh, lively discussion in your, uh, your panel. Give us the highlights. Yeah, I mean, much like um, Bud, we had a, a diverse panel, so we covered um, small operators, as in small fleets, domestic, all the way up to um, multinational with large fleets. Um, and, and one thing that came out of it was that we're all considered lifeline um, in what we do. And I think we we also focused on the fact that previously with the way, you know, we build assets like Bud, like, like all operators that last for 30 years, but at the moment, our focus has been brought down particularly by the pandemic we've been working on a day-to-day -day basis in some cases and we do need to make sure that as operators and, and for companies that we're getting our vision back into the strategic and it sounds like buds buds industry from the cruise side is finding that perhaps a little easier than than we are on a ferries where we are literally providing lifeline services on a day-to-day -day basis we we focus very much around ship design um and and there were two two aspects to that some of it was the the, the platform design itself, the life cycle analysis, the recycling, how we can incorporate flexibility into the design so that the vessels are future proofed. Because at the moment, particularly as a result of COVID, our customers' needs are changing. Um, Brexit has an impact on that as well. We don't necessarily know what our customers' needs are going to be, but we do need to replace our tonnage so that it can meet their needs. Um, fuel supply design, of course, is a, a huge thing for us, the ultimate zero carbon propulsion side of things so we've got to have adaptability now to comply in the future because one of the biggest challenges facing the ferry industry is the the availability of shoreside power and infrastructure 
Um, where we got to with that was the, the collaboration. Um, and it's this international design collaboration that we think is needed for the ferry industry. We're all trying to work as operators um, and whether in collaboration with operators together or locally, but the, the infrastructure side of things is the biggest challenge. Um, for example, in Southampton, we, we can't get the electricity to the port yet. Um, and I know that's a challenge for, for Budside as well. Um, we also talked about the, the people design aspect. So the design of recruitment and the promotion of careers and the training and development for the onboard experience. And one of the things we, we talked about at some length was the, the challenges at the moment, given the fatigue levels we've seen due to the pandemic and what that's doing to people's focus on safety. So we were all obviously, as you can imagine, very clear that safety doesn't trump COVID, but that the impact of COVID has had an, probably an impact on our perceptions of safety. So we, we do have some challenges around that. One of the, the upsides I think we saw was with recruitment that because of the, the temporary suspension of the cruise industry, there is an upside in recruitment for us and availability, but of course that will reverse as soon as cruise restarts. Mm. The safety side is, a, is an interesting one. We, we're all in agreement that we need to design out the solutions at much more of a design stage. And I think historically in shipping, we've been guilty of doing what we think is right and leaving our seafarers to, to, to find the workarounds and to work safely. And certainly since I went to sea in 1993, we've seen big changes to that. Um, personally, I think COVID will add another stretch to that as we look at the, the biological design of our vessels as well. Um, yes. I would say the key point really that came for us was the, coll the collaboration. Um, and we did a, a, a poll in it um, to say, do we think the structures exist to promote the collaboration required in respect of vessel regulatory and crew design? 75% of the respondents didn't think that the, the structures existed, but the, as a panel, we, we thought that the chamber was the ideal forum for improving this. Do you think that, um, you know, we, we, we've heard similar things from all, all of you so far. And I mean, particularly Guy, I know you were talking about trade, but uh, wearing your, your day hat as uh, ICS rather than just moderator of, uh, of international trade talks. I mean, that, that question of crew and collaboration across sectors, we, we still are quite fragmented. We still are quite a siloed industry. And I know that that has uh, affected the way in which we have dealt with this crewing crisis. I mean, a question to all of you, I guess, but let's start with Guy. I mean, do you think that we will have learned some lessons as an industry in terms of how we can improve what Fran says, that that, that collaboration in terms of not just, you know, how the industry operates on a, on a sexual level, but how we operate as a whole industry? I, I think actually we've think that unprecedented levels of cooperation and collaboration over the last year it's been one of the real real positives of the of the the, the, the whole crisis you know i mean i've been on calls with fran on diversity and equality and all sorts of other type of things you know their ability to be able to to have that collaboration is actually it's been found to be, it's not as hard as we thought and i think you know the work we've done with imo and the international labor organization and others we've built relationships there and i think if you think what we, we from a standing start a year ago we've had UN General Assembly resolutions on, on, on seafarers. We've had international labor organization coming out against governments on breaking the law. We, we've had you know, all sorts of welfare issues. We, we, we're, we're working really hard together now on the vaccination conundrum, particularly for those seafarers from developing nations. And it's, so I, I think there's a real positive and, and, and I think it's cut across sectors as well because we've actually all had lots in common. So I, I think to me, it's been definitely one of the positives of the last year. And what we need to do is make sure that when we do move out, and we will move out, we're all optimists, we will come out of this, is we don't lose sight of that collaboration and we actually work together because the bigger challenges ahead, we've got to decarbonise our industry over the next 30 years and that's going to be a huge challenge for all of us. And we're only going to do that by working together, not working apart. Yes, yes. I mean, I you know that that optimism comes comes through. I mean, it, it's perhaps, uh, you know, it would be surprising, I guess, to anybody from outside the industry coming and looking into these conversations that you're having about quite how optimistic we are as a sector, uh, given everything that we're dealing with, given the fact that, uh, you know, the cruise sector has ships effectively laid up, that we have, you know, a crewing crisis well covered in the mainstream press as, you know, hundreds of thousands of seafarers being impacted. I mean, you, you might be forgiven for looking at shipping and thinking, oh my God, what is going on? 
but I'm hearing overall optimism and I'm hearing that you will be taking a lot of that forward. I mean, perhaps, uh, Bud, coming back to you, I mean, optimistic about how we can work a little bit more collaboratively and, and, and retain some of the lessons we've learned in this crisis, take it forward and actually make the industry better as a result. I'm extremely optimistic about that, and I, I share much of what Guy just said. And um, one thing that he didn't mention, but maybe it's implied, is, and I think it's much to the credit of Guy and his organization, I don't think that there's ever been a time when ship owners and uh, labor, particularly through the ITF, mm -hmm. have been working so closely shoulder to shoulder, pulling the same direction. And and I, I, I really have to give, um, you know, credit where credit's due with Steve Cotton and his organization. I think they've been extremely helpful in trying to work through these problems together and they've been great partners and I hope we can carry that forward. I mean, we have a, um, even normal times, you know, there's enough challenges we have to deal with in crisis. I think we've proven that we can really come together when it comes to ship owners. I agree with the guy. I mean, if there is a silver lining in this cloud and for the most part, you know, it has been quite a cloud for all of society. Um, it said it, it was a unifying force for uh, in our in our industry anyway for ship owners to, to come together and work shoulder to shoulder this challenge we've got in front of us with decarbonization um, was the biggest challenge we were going to face before covid covid's going to be a transitory situation you know even if it's around in some form we will have learned to live with it decarbonization is not going away it is going to continue to be a huge challenge and we've got to meet and no one company frankly, no one sector can tackle that problem alone. So I'm really mm -hmm. hoping that we can take the lessons we've learned here of how to work together more effectively and respectful of diverse opinions and embracing diverse opinions will carry over into how we interact with other sectors as well to solve you know, that problem too. And I, and I do think there've been some great lessons to learn from here. Uh, relationships have been built, which I really hope will be durable uh, and um, over time, because I think trust has been developed in a way that um, it, it hasn't before, because we haven't had really such a unifying event happen in my time in, in the shipping industry so far. Fran, final few minutes for you. I mean, uh, we, I, I take it you would agree with that sort of general level of optimism, but I mean, do you think the the catalyzing of certain things, necessity being the mother of invention in some respects, you know, will be taken forward? Are you, are you positive that we can we can make the industry better as a result of the challenges we faced over the last twelve months? Yeah, absolutely, and I think we we've seen that the agility that perhaps we haven't had as an industry has come through in spades. Um, at, at every level, I think that the point I would take, and I absolutely agree with the collaboration we've got internally, that what we need to do is we need to make sure we extend that collaboration externally and we need to include governments, we need to include other industries and we need to look at the end to end supply chain for the collaboration. So I think that would be my takeaway from it. But on the optimism side, you know, shipping, has, as somebody said, shipping has been around 2000 years, it's going to be around another 2000 years. We're, we're just changing. We might be generally slower at evolution but we're actually at a point now where we're probably at revolution and this is our chance to drive that forward and making sure we've got the right people the right young people coming through into the industry who've not got the historic view but who've got the innovation and the the, the lateral thought process to give us those ideas is really exciting excellent well thank you uh to to, to each of you for the for the first session now i'm not entirely sure how the technology works i'm assuming that you're going to sort of morph Doctor Who style into <laughs> on tillage, offshore and offshore wind. Uh, if not, I'm afraid, Guy, I'm going to need you to talk for at least 20 minutes on offshore wind. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a button I'm supposed to press, but uh, at this point, um, you are all still here. Mm. We, perhaps I think I'll uh, try that and leave a space. You, you leave and see if it will be, the hole will be filled by others. Ah, there we go. By the power of technology, I have some more people. Welcome, Ewan. Hi. Hello. Uh, we have Steve. Excellent. And we should be having one more, I believe. Susan 
joining us. I hope Rich will join us in a second. Okay, all right. So, uh, as I say, we're having to do this in uh, two tranches because uh, there's so much discussion we needed to uh, split you up. Um, let's, uh, let's ask you the same questions. I, I, I'm going to come to you each. Uh, you give me a, a, a quick summary of the sort of key takeaways from, from your uh, various sessions. Um, uh, Steve, let's start with you, if you don't mind, because uh, I'm afraid I didn't get a chance to come in, uh, which is a shame because uh, I always find um, you know, discussions around the terrorist sector you know, to be genuinely some of the more interesting bits of the industry. Give us a, a flavour of what was on the agenda in your session. Right, uh, Richard, yeah. I mean, it was actually a, a very exciting discussion. We uh, started off on the road to decarbonisation, which is a very big challenge for the towage industry at the moment. Um, as you are quite aware, you know, tugs are of a certain size, so it's not uh, going to be an easy operation to uh, look at alternative fuels. But towage is committed to decarbonisation, uh, and we've seen already incredible changes over the decades. Um, there's no simple, easy answer. Uh, we had a, the panel we had was a great uh, selection from naval architects, shipbuilders, tug owners, and uh, uh, insurers. And so everybody was agreed that there, there's not there's not one uh, answer to this. Um, the problem is is that over the last uh, uh, recent in recent years the amount of investment has been quite high so we've got to find a way of uh, allowing that investment to continue uh, and finding a way to decarbonize at the same time um, things like hybrid tugs we discussed uh, they have uh, limits to uh, to their operating pattern which uh, but at the moment it seems to be the consensus that they're the clear and and obvious choice in the short to medium term as we look at new uh, alternative fuels uh, in the year to come beyond 2030. Um, and they, actually for smaller tugs, uh, Darman made the point there that uh, fully electric is now possible and actually they can do berthing and unberthing operations. But there is a big problem with the shoreside infrastructure um, and um, that uh, is going to be continued not just with small tugs but with big tugs too. Um, the, the infrastructure is going to be a serious challenge and that's why we have to work uh, in partnership with the ports that we're operating in. Um, it's a challenge to be competitive uh, already. It's going to be a, a, an even bigger challenge um, with a, uh, having to make a lot of expenditure on uh, new tugs with uh, new forms of fuel or uh, operation. And for sure, there's going to have to be some form of state assistance in order for this to be uh, progressive because uh, uh, it, it's not something that we're going to be able to do on our own um, and certainly that infrastructure uh, for um, shore power needs to be there uh, we we talked also uh, about the safety record of the towage industry it has improved uh, incredibly over the last 20 years um, but accidents still occur and one accident is always too many um, we looked at where the root causes of, uh, uh, you know, we, we have to look at the root causes of those accidents through analysis uh, and look at the trends uh, where we're coming from. And of course, this then fed into the, the fatigue angle, which is uh, a, a major issue because, because the human body is uh, likes its daily rhythm. And when it's out of context on the daily rhythm, uh, we, we then have fatigue issues. And so, with digitalization coming, uh, we're seeing already, you know, with let's say just in time arrivals and port digitalization, that could actually seriously affect that rhythm. Uh, but at the same time, digitalization and uh, new technology will hopefully uh, outweigh the, 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 the balance there. So it will become a balance, more balanced uh, um, operation in terms of fatigue as well, because uh, uh, albeit we have a, a, a good uh, sense of uh, work balance and home balance uh, for you know crews could do seven days on seven days off it's in a uh, it's in a sheltered environment um, so the fatigue issue we should get around um, we looked at the fact of why aren't we attracting more women and in fact I was quite conscious that the the panel was made up of all men uh, we were hoping for a, a, a woman on there but actually 
it, it didn't happen. And so we did look at uh, um, what the obstacles are, and there are not that many obstacles really. Um, and Spitzer uh, actually told us of uh, the Spitzer Monte Cristo, which uh, the tug there operating in Dominican Republic is an all-female crew. And so that's uh, uh, quite a recent innovation from them, and we look forward to seeing how that's going to go and, and the differences between the tugs, uh, are what's going to happen in, in the future there. So that's quite exciting. Uh, but I did see a question from a, a young lady on the side there as we were talking away, saying that she'd been trying to apply for jobs in the towage industry uh, for some time, and she'd been getting quite a lot of rejections based on the current standard of accommodation was not suitable. And so that actually was quite a uh, uh, quite a telling remark. And so that's something which we've still got to work out. Um, and then finally, we went on to the, the, the towage contract, which we, we tend to use, the UK standard towage conditions, um, which was uh, actually first written in 1933, when tugs were much smaller, uh, much smaller operators. They were very, very concerned about liabilities. And uh, the last revision of that was in 1986. So with the amount of technology and uh, uh, um, different things coming into operation now, up to 2030, we can see that there's going to be uh, a, a big input there to uh, make that fit for purpose uh, towards 2030 and hopefully have it there for its centenary in 2033. Um, so that's where we were. Marvellous. Thank you for the summary. Uh, always surprised, you know, quite how um, interchangeable the same issues are across the different sectors, albeit with different flavours. And uh, certainly, you know, the issues of crew and digitalization, decarbonisation are pretty universal, but obviously applied with very specific questions. And I, I, the, the the question of infrastructure being the sort of the key to so many questions, I, I firmly believe that if you uh, Throw enough engineering brain power at uh, the um, at the seashore uh, side of uh, the issues, we will sort out decarbonisation pretty quickly. It's the shore side issue that we are going to struggle with because very much so. And 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 of course, from the towage point of view, decarbonisation is being pushed by the local, national, and international authorities. So, so it's it's the port authorities, of course, that will be pushing this perhaps in this country more than most. And so, really, that infrastructure has to be there. Excellent. Marvellous. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous session, uh, please do get in with your questions. I will try and get them to the panellists as we can, but uh, running a little bit short on time. So I'm going to come to you, Susan, next. Um, I want to hear all about offshore wind. I am fascinated by this sector, but I just I don't know enough about it. So give me the uh, give me the highlights. Uh, what's. Yeah, it was a fascinating session and um, we Came, we brought together just a few key points, so you'll get a really good feel for it. So, uh, Alan Taylor from Bayes, um, Business Environment, uh, Business Energy and Industrial Strategy, he talked about better collaboration, of course, between the supply chain and developers, and that was absolutely crucial. We could feel we needed more collaboration, and Bayes will be looking into gaining a little bit more depth of understanding into the marine supply chain needs. So that was excellent. Then Arnstein Eknes from DNVGL, he reiterated, reiterated that decarbonisation is here to stay. Offshore wind can be a major contributor to new green fuel for short sea shipping, he mentioned. The key is for wind farm developers to understand how to offer electric charging or production of hydrogen or ammonia as fuel, for example. And there was also a recognition that the offshore wind industry geographical range and scale is expanding with the need for more vessels and with the new builds uh, reducing emissions. He said it was difficult to gain investment because it's so speculative. Uh, so collaboration will be absolutely key. So again, that theme of collaboration, it's just everywhere and understanding each other's worlds. I think that's the other thing that came across. Kevin Brown from BB Marine was talking about better shoreside infrastructure, which is absolutely crucial to support offshore operations and technological improvements to increase the longevity of vessel. I mean, you know, we can deliver green today, but we need to have the infrastructure for tomorrow now almost. So that's important for, for the ports and for us to be talking very coherently with the ports. 
Then John Vingo from Seajack. So it's really nice. We had a great balance of people who really understood about offshore wind and then also understood about the shipping industry. But John from Seajack said um, that the challenges will continue for um, uh, installation vessels in offshore wind to win contracts, despite the perception of growth at pace and the scale of the industry. Uh, there's a drive towards lowering costs in the CFD process, and that actually doesn't lend itself to sustaining very high capex investments for, for vessels, yeah? But also, they themselves need to decarbon, decarbonize. So in a way, offshore winds may be being, it's, we're thinking about ourselves, but we've mm. got to think about the supply chain. If we really, really want to decarbonize together, we've got to do a little bit more collaboration over this. And it needs to be quite timely, because you know with offshore wind it can take seven to eight years in the planning after which we've sort of got the guardrails of where we of how we've got to operate and so mm -hmm. adding things at a late moment doesn't really work very well and then Hernan Vargas and my colleague from Vattenfall suggested that collaboration is key but in order to do this energy companies need to know the details of how they can help to prioritize investment we need to understand the energy vectors, you know, what fuel, we need to understand the demand, how much, you know, how's it all going to look, what bit's going to be offshore and what bit's going to be onshore in the port infrastructure. Basically, what will it all look like into the future? So that sort of gave a, a little bit of a background. Um, I mean, I, I think we, we need more time to explore how offshore winds can both accelerate and stimulate greener fuels for shipping and in Arnstein's view, Arnstein's view, this can be done. Mm. And I left the session feeling that, um, you know, we need each other a little bit more than we probably realised. The shipping industry could make use of the massive scale and growth of green power that wind is, is about to have and it's about to embark on. These next 10 years are critical for us and it would be huge. And, you know, that might be the, through electricity or hydrogen or ammonium, you know, whatever's decided on. But mm. actually, we need the shipping industry. It's linked to, you know, how we green our supply chain. Of course, it's an imperative. And it's also part of the government's expectations for us to stimulate a green supply chain. And we're going to be measured on that, on that impact. So there's something there about good for both that we need to continue exploring. Do you get the impression that, you know, there is that visibility in shipping? I, it's one of the topics that I find is certainly mentioned as something of a buzzword. Everybody's quite excited about it, but probably doesn't quite understand how the intersection between shipping and offshore wind is going to work out and where the opportunities lie, which is crucial for ship owners. You know, that's where they uh, are focused. It sounds very exciting, but how am I going to make some money out of it is generally the question that they're asking. Yeah, I, I, that's a very good question. I think we don't understand, well, I certainly don't understand each other's worlds well enough, but there might be lots of people like me making decisions. So, um, you know, I, I think we've got to take much more care over understanding timescales, each other's problems, each other's issues, uh, because actually it's only then in that space of the trust and care that we can find the right um, financial solutions they might be grants we know there are a lot coming up now that we can tap into so we yeah much more closer working and we do know that there are some excellent examples of sort of early adoption here you know mm. even today there were I, i've got a list of them there were two or three well i'm very glad that it's uh it, it's getting the visibility it deserves and i think just putting on agendas like this is a really good mm. positive Forward. So hopefully uh, enough people have uh, started asking the right questions. But uh, Susan, thank you for, for your... Uh, thank your... you, Richard. Uh, now, we, we're going to end, obviously. I mean, I was, I was, I was hoping for a bit of optimism uh, and then uh, we're coming to offshore. So um, do your best, Ewan. <laughs> yeah, I think I should have attended the offshore wind section instead. <laughs> no, um, no, we had a good session as well. We had uh, three subsectors of offshore that... Uh, took part in the in the panel uh, we had the drilling side the construction side and then the offshore support vessels which is what i represent um so 
the first thing interesting before we started to look ten years ahead, you know, we felt there's a you know there is a pressing issue that that we feel you know needs addressed. It's been talked about in the I think in the various discussions so far, but the real challenges that we're facing for our crews at the moment uh, with the new quarantine lists, where we've got individuals who are maybe having to quarantine before they get onto a vessel, do their stint, and then having to quarantine when they go home, and you know, and what that does to the individual's mental health and all the challenges that goes around with them maybe being away from their families for much for much longer so once we can get over that and we're sure that you know the chamber is helping us with the, the discussions on that which is which is great we started to look uh, a little bit further ahead so from the from the drilling side of things um, i think we recognize that we're we're a boom and bust driven uh, industry uh, we go through the cycles with the with the oil price which drives how many uh, uh, exploration wells are drill, drilled and, and, and such like uh, so the key thing really we can't control that so we just need to be disciplined you know we talked about how we uh, how we react and how we adjust to it so we're we're quite used to that um we're quite an innovative sector we, we definitely uh, are able to develop technology and and, and, uh, and develop the industry but one of the big concerns at the moment is that oil and gas is effectively a dirty word um, we've, we've fallen out of favor and you know that has multiple effects for us one of the big concerns is is how we can hold on to and attract talent into the into the sector um, because let's be honest although 2030 is targets and 2050s targets oil and gas should be around for a few more years to come there will be a need for it so you know, we're not shutting up shop in a few years so we need to make sure that we hold on to the the skill set that we have so that we can continue to develop and 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 come along that energy transition and become greener uh, as part of the as part of the, the journey um the other thing that makes it harder for is obviously to get funding so we're talking a lot about uh, investment in making our vessels or our rigs uh, greener and cleaner which is it's a huge capital investment um, but again i think it's probably easier to get funding for a renewables project than it is for an oil and gas project and so so there are a few challenges there and somehow we need to to retain our relevance in the in the industry and make people realize that you know there is still still for a place for us so until there are the green vessels to to put the, the, the wind farms up you know you need to utilize uh, you know conventional vessels so so we still need to produce the oil and gas so it's a bit of a, a bit of a cycle um, from the construction side of things, um, you know, a lot of technological developments taking place there. An opportunity that was reviewed was the the possibility to benefit for uh, hardware standardization, greater digitalization, and, and potentially even automation, which will drive a lot of efficiencies for us. Um, and on the OSV side of things, you know, we're a very fragmented market. There's very low barriers to entry. There's lots of OSV operators out there. Uh, so it means that we, as an industry, carry a huge amount of management and, and burden of G&A costs. So to improve the, the profitability and the, the sustainability of the, the, the industry, the, the truth is consolidation in the short term. More consolidation makes, makes a heck of a lot of sense so we can get control, discipline, and a, and a, and a much better playing field. Um, the other thing that we talked a little bit about was the fact that the, looking at the, the new technologies, battery solutions are out there. You know, we see in Norway that they're, they're pretty much a, a given. You know, that's the way they're going. People are investing in it. There's funding coming from the government for, for battery solutions. The clients are specifying them. Not so much on the UK side of things. So, so that's an area that, you know, it's, I think it was mentioned earlier on in one of the sessions. You know, if the clients demand it, we have to deliver it much quicker than if they, they don't really give as much attention to it. And I think what we've seen is they're not really willing to pay for it at this point in time. Um, maybe when they realize that it's their emissions, not just our emissions, they're running the, their, you know, it's their operation, it's them that's running the vessel effectively, and uh, maybe that will, will change. So again, I'm going back to the word of collaboration. And I think you know, that comes through, if we can have oil companies uh, come in collaboration with us and give us much much longer contracts uh, then we can invest in the technology knowing that the, the the return on that investment will be paid back just giving us a few months worth of contract for you know for a short period just it's a hard sell for us to invest the money to to do it but i think all owners 
know that we're we're going to be going down that line. It's just it's extremely hard at the moment while technology is still being developed. And you know, you go down the route of the the battery solution today, um, you know, which will give you a certain amount of saving. Um, when hopefully somebody comes up with a much better technology over the next couple of years, that that's effectively redundant, and our investment won't be paid off. So, so I think it's it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg. We all know we need to get there, but it's tentative steps. You know, some of us have made the the steps into the battery technology. You know, we've we've got a few in the fleet already, um, but there is a concern that in the future, you know, it might be overtaken with, with someone else. Um, touching on the the actual um, declining opportunities as well. You know how we adapt to that. Uh, you know we, we talked about you know offshore wind as a as a potential alternative. I thought it was interesting when Susan mentioned there. You know needing new builds. Well, I've got an awful lot of vessels that could potentially be converted into vessels. What we have seen from the offshore wind sector is quite often that they they demand new builds and they specify in such a way that it's hard to retrofit a. a uh, PS, an old PSV, well not even old, <laughs> a relatively modern PSV to do the job. It could do it if the specification was was amended. So, you know, that's something that we, we've, we've definitely looked at and there's opportunities because it seems a shame to scrap vessels when there's enough life in them to, to move into another another market. Okay. Wonderful. Listen, Ewan, thank you. We could go on a lot, but I believe we are about to be booted out from our, our virtual stage by Paddy Rogers. Um, so uh, I will uh, really just wrap things up by saying thank you to all the, uh, the, the, the various speakers today, uh, particularly the moderators. Um, I think, you know, unsurprising to hear that we have uh, challenges to overcome as an industry. We knew that uh, what I think is heartening to listen to is the fact that there is quite so much collaboration and, and optimism across all the sectors in terms of how we can take the challenges of the last 12 months and make this industry a better place of results. Um, I'm sure Paddy is going to do uh, the full wrap up in, in, in a second, but uh, I would just like to add my thanks to all the comments that are coming through on, on the platform to the uh, the organizers behind the conference in the UK chamber. Uh, an excellent uh, showcase of uh, you know all of the best bits, I would say, of the industry, even Paddy. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Richard, thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, I um, I can't tell you what uh, an enjoyable day it's been. I thought it was uh, thoroughly uh, thoroughly exciting. I, I have to admit that I don't get out much these days, so um, uh, that's probably the same as the rest of you. Um, it really has been a very um, broad and wide ranging, and I found it um, thoroughly uh, enjoyable. Now, I just wanted to um, to say that we've heard lots of different things. Um, I heard concerns about future proofing. I heard concerns about um, uh, uh, avoiding stranded assets. Uh, early on, we heard a creed occur uh, asking for um, uh, some direction from the industry uh, and engine manufacturers to help with um, to help with showing the path through to an efficient way of decarbonizing. But I think that the mood of this day has changed a lot from what I've heard in the past. I heard a lot more talk about there being a patchwork quilt or a portfolio approach. It felt like there was a great deal of excitement around trying to really get involved in terms of trying to scale prototypes or at least trying to find ways of working so that we seem to have moved from identifying a problem and scoping it out into actually manifestly trying to find solutions, that there is an incremental move to change. And I think that's really, really positive. Uh, one of the speakers talked earlier on today, I think it was Tristan Smith, mentioned a brutal decade of change, but it was off, It was counterpointed with um, the, de the decade of opportunity. And I really think it's very important that people see that. We've been through this very stressful 12 months, not over yet, another good while to go with COVID and the pandemic, but it has acted as an accelerator for driving certain ways in which we socialize, interact, exchange and collaborate. And maybe this is going to be our opportunity, a kind of little mini hothouse of the kind of ways we're going to have to learn to work together if we're going to solve some of those really big intractable issues uh, as of leading our way to decarbonizing. So we've had a way lit to us, which is greater collaboration, really making a bigger effort, do more reading, do more getting out, go to more conferences, meet people in other industries. This is not a shipping problem, decarbonizing. It is a world problem. 
and that this is the decade when it's really going to have to happen if we're going to meet the commitments that we've made. And I think we can all agree that those commitments have to be met because we're faced with a challenge that humanity will not survive if it doesn't address. Um, I have the luxury of being um, uh, the director of the Royal Observatory as well as the National Maritime Museum. And sometimes it's easy to forget that we live on the Goldilocks planet. Venus is too hot to sustain life. Mars is too cold. The poles, even on our own Earth, are too cold and the equator sometimes too hot. And the oceans distribute heat and make more of the Earth more habitable for human beings. Looking after the ocean, looking after the planet, these are our number one priorities. And we'll have to do it by being more collaborative, by working harder together, and by being more innovative. That means that our employees and our systems and our ways of working must not just be systems of compliance, they have to be systems of driving and increasing capability. Our conversations have to get smarter and we have to be driven all the time to put the important ahead of the urgent. So as we start to think about it, we can use a motto, I'm reusing a motto that a company that I worked with used to use in the past, which was people, planet, profits. That there can be a way that market-based solutions can bring an answer to our problems, but only if we scale up on the way that we collaborate and improve our knowledge and experience, and at the same time, we keep the focus on our desperate need to stop the planet warming up. Now, uh, today has been thoroughly exciting, and I think Richard's already thanked all of the speakers and the panelists. It probably just remains for me to thank Bob Sanguinetti for inviting us all and for organizing the day together with everybody else at the chamber. And last but by no means least, to thank you because today was made by the participants and their contributions. So it's been a really enjoyable day. I'm thoroughly excited by what we've heard and uh, particularly interested in what the next few years are going to bring and how you're going to change your ways of working. What are you going to do when you get back to the office that's going to make a difference to making sure that this is your decade of opportunity? Thank you all very much.